Well, we should always be sympathetic. We've got some questions, I think, that have come in on the chat. So I'm just going to have a little look at them and uh, see. Here we are at the q and if you'll excuse me. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've got a, a, a quite a lot of very specific and good and intelligent questions, as I knew we would. We could be here quite happily all night. But just coming off the top here, um, uh, what are your thoughts on, on AANA 12-step programs and their insistence on absolute abstinence from all mood-altering substances? Uh, do, you think, do you think that's key, really, for people who are wanting to recover from addiction? Uh, well, I think if AA works for you or AANA works for you, then that's great. But we know it works for a relatively small fraction of people who try to use it. And I, I just want, a lot of people won't know this, but it's, I want to tell you the story of AA and the role of psychedelics in AA. And uh, the founder of AA, Bill Wilson, was a Yale graduate. He was 33. He'd been a, a chronic inebriate since the age of 18. And he was having a sort of his last chance. He was being detoxified. And, and he, the prospect was he was going to go into an institution as a chronic inebriate. And he had a psychedelic experience in that withdrawal period in which he saw a wind, not of God, but of power floating through him. And he said, I'm free. I'm now free of my alcoholism. Uh, and, and he became a, 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 an advocate for psychedelic therapy. Uh, he founded AA and he got the American government to fund six trials of LSD for alcoholism. And, and, and they, it's one or two doses proved to be really, really well, remarkable, more effective than any treatment we've ever got since. And you know, he, he, there was the, the AA was using LSD to break people, allow people to break the bound, you know, the chains of alcoholism. And then in 1967, when LSD is made illegal in America, there's a schism. There are those in AA who say we can't break the law, and so we won't allow LSD, and and, and then no other drugs. Or those who said, well, we're going to do it underground. Hmm. And, and the, the sad reality is that in those 50, whatever it is, 54 years now since LSD was made illegal. Over 100 million people worldwide have died from alcoholism. And if LSD had been made available, maybe uh, it would probably have helped at least 10%, maybe more. So that's 10 million lives which could have been safe if we had not made it illegal. And then you say, well, on the other side of the equation, well, how many lives have been saved by banning LSD? And I would have said, well, maybe a thousand. <laughs> you know, so the equation is utterly against the medical use. I mean, I could, I could see you're pretty keen on LSD at the moment, but, but and it's true that Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, took it in, in the late 40s, early 50s after Sandals. But of course, he founded AA in the mid 1930s. Yes, right. And remember, the, the G word appears prominently all over the 12 steps of Alcoholics yes. Anonymous, yes. God. And, yes. you know, William James and his masterful lectures the varieties of religious experience makes the flat statement the only known cure for dipsomania i.e alcoholism is religiomania yeah, yeah. Well, what do you say to that i mean in aa you might see it as a sort of caduceus a sort of intertwining of religious and medical thinking uh, including psychotherapy that's gone into the aa program but they're all there aren't they well it's it's not i don't think Wilson was thinking about God in the sense that many that the, 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 the ultra Puritan American Protestants think about God, you know, as a as a white robed figure with a beard sitting up there looking down at you. I think he was his experience was one of of some kind of understanding that there is more to life than alcohol at the very least, and certainly perhaps more to life than what you normally see. Well, so I, I, I couldn't agree with you less. I think if you understand the AA program and you know the history of AA, you know it comes out of the great religious revival of true. the 19th century. That and its, its closest relation as an organization is Christian science and the idea that you let go of the conscious mind in order to let the Holy Spirit heal you. Uh, and, and I can't believe, David, that you've got much time for Christian science. <laughs> No, but the, what we are very interested in the idea of the mystical being part of the beneficial experience of psychedelics. And I can see that being particularly relevant to, to people who are completely in love with a, a drug. 
breaking that getting falling in love with god is yeah it's potentially powerful way of getting something even more important in your life than than uh, than the drug mm-hmm. and, and i think the problem with aa is it kind of it forces you to do that in a way which is very cerebral i mean if we just look at religion generally most people who are religious are actually trying to find a relationship with god which they haven't got they're, they're desperately seeking the revelation that some of their leaders have and so you know and if psychedelics get you there then uh, why not why not use them well is a short path to enlightenment it's called in some Absolutely. traditions I'm, I'm getting the questions up again um david i understand you're involved in elvarius an irish-based startup exploring psychedelic compound 5-meo dmt dimethyltryptamine our old friend we're off with terence mckenna and food of the gods the mm. drug addiction treatment uh, what's your connection with the business how did you get so, involved i'm advising a number of companies because we've done this pioneering work on the brain science of psychedelics and also on the um the translating the science into the treatment of depression we've done, now done two trials of psilocybin in depression i've been approached by a number of companies to guide them as to how whether they can develop alternatives uh, and five methoxy dmt you know there's the toad it's the scrapings of the toad although we're not getting it from the toad we're getting it from plants you've got Isn't to it? lick it off the live toad well that's what you can pick it off and store it as well you don't have to have the toad to be and actually, we want to stop people using the toad because it's they're going to be threatened by people going, getting the stuff from them. It we, is a worry. It is. I, so, yeah. I honestly think I've taken every drug you've researched. I've probably taken more of it than you've researched of it. That may well be true. <laughs> but anyway, do you, do you think that's a goer, do you, the toad juice? Well, the, there are people who say, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, that it, it is a particularly powerful uh psychedelic that can produce you know maybe quite rapid and, and powerful changes in in people's um, attitudes and partic- particularly in addiction so so and also there's some animal work that's been done in ireland where the company is showing that you can can reset animals addictions with it so yeah i don't know i mean the main thing is that that there are there are many many possible indications for psychedelics the serotonergic psychedelics mm-hmm. and the more companies that are working in this space the faster we're going to get to finding out what the utility is and, and what the best way of using it is okay let's let's go to another question because they're, they're pretty damn good questions um okay so war on drugs has now moved to nicotine particular low-risk nicotine products such as e-cigarettes and heated tobacco bloomberg's millions is fueling the demand for worldwide prohibition yes that bloomberg he hates tobacco mm-hmm. um the, do you know he once uh, he saw Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones smoking a cigarette on stage at a gig in Central Park and sent the NYPD to arrest him for smoking yeah. in the park. Um, so Bloomberg's billions is fueling the demand for worldwide prohibition, and the World Health Organization now considers them dangerous. Uh, the U.S. has either banned or limited flavors, <laughs> and the EU is going the same way. How is it possible to avert the uh, the avalanche? Only public health England remains pragmatic. What's your view? Well, totally. I mean, I, I'm a great supporter of public health England. We have stood alone against the rest of the world. We've argued that the rational use of um, particularly vaping is the way forward. And uh, uh, what we're seeing, you know, the, the nicotine argument is it's it's purely political. And that there are in, the tobacco harm reduction people, the people that want to ban smoking. Uh, they're an enormous business with, you know, the Bloomberg billions behind them, and they've they've corrupted the science or the the thinking of the WHO, and you have this absurd situation now in countries like India where you know you can go to prison for selling uh, a vape, but you can advertise cigarettes, and uh, it, I think the anti-vaping lobby, the science, there are some supposed scientists there, and they they really should feel ashamed of themselves because. What they want is to eliminate all smoking, which you will not get because most governments don't want that. Most governments get an income from smoking. And, and so they've turned their attacks. They know they can't stop smoking. So they've turned their attacks they've, to, to vaping because it's a new nascent industry, you know, very, you know, a lot of small producers. And it's just easy for them to attack. And, and, and 
they don't seem to care that it's going to, in the end, going to be to the detriment of the people who would benefit from baking. Or are we overstating government's importance in the sense that if you look at some of the epochal changes in drug use in our society, the Defence of the Realm Act of 1916, which was, it was actually an appendix to the main act, uh, which was solely aimed at a drug panic involving American servicemen using cocaine in London during the First World War. So the first prohibitions on the unlicensed sale of heroin and cocaine occurred as an adjunct to a Civil Defence Act. And they followed a wholesale abandonment of opiate drugs that had occurred in the, in the preceding 20 or 25 years since the late 19th century. And arguably what stopped people using opiate drugs was salicylic acid, it was aspirin. Uh, you know, so people had something else to, to, oh, get, to kill the baby's pain and, and so on yeah, and so exactly. forth. Is it the same with tobacco? I mean, you say you can't get rid of tobacco, but it, within our adult lifetimes, we've seen smoking go from the majority of the adult population to mm. under 20%. That's pretty intense, isn't it? Yeah, but it's flattened out. Mm. I mean, the, uh, the, re the, uh, the decrease, all the decrease now in tobacco smoking is driven by vaping. And in countries like Australia, which don't allow it, they are not seeing any further reduction. I've got to say, I called my vape the witch's tit. I found it so addictive since you didn't actually have to light it or cause any smoke. Yeah. I would literally wake up in the middle of the night and find I was involuntarily mm. sucking on this thing. And it was actually the vape and the compulsiveness of vaping that led me to finally give up tobacco and nicotine altogether. I thought I can, I can, this is going to be even worse than my tobacco. Yeah, but, but what a lot of people do, you know, um, is yes, is that they 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 carry on vaping, but they vape less and less nicotine. And so there are plenty of people that don't vape any nicotine, but they still like the nipple. You know, to that's your... just a Chinese addiction cure. That's what we junkies used to call it, where you have a solution of heroin and you just add water every time you take yes, a fix. That's right, that's right, that's that's your right. shit never works. I don't believe it, David. I don't believe the research on that. Well, it's let's not get... much research, but it's anecdote anyway. Right. Well, let's get another question in. Um, okay. So psychosis specifically and psilocybin, have we got any results yet on you know, psilocybin and, and psychosis rather than depression? Well, we haven't used it to try to treat psychosis. A, theoretically, it could make it worse. And, you know, and we avoid giving it to people who've been psychotic or who've got a first degree relative, you know, a brother, sister, or father, or mother with psychosis. But there are people that write to me and say they've cured their schizophrenia with, uh, with mushrooms or ayahuasca. And it's, that's not completely implausible some aspects of psychosis could be disrupted in a positive way but there's always a risk you might it might make things worse so mm. at present we're steering away from that okay let's see what else we've got up here i love these questions they're so authoritative um hmm. more more on psychedelics here i mean one of one of the worries that somebody's shouting out is that you need more therapists in mm. order to and certainly, yeah. I don't know if you saw that book by Michael Pollan, uh, Out of Your Head, or whatever it was called. Um, How to Change Your Mind. How to Change Your Mind. And well, that's a beautiful book. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> yes, I mean, I quite liked it. But again, you know, you're, you're Snow White, but it, even somebody like Michael Pollan, to me, is a lightweight. I mean, what was he doing? He took all these psychedelics under clinical conditions, you know, researchers put you in headphones playing that ghastly tinkly music you get in health spas mm -hmm. in a darkened room. If I'm going to take a major psychedelic drug, I want to walk around a large city or, mm -hmm. you know, climb a mountain. That's what's really exciting. Nobody who uses these compounds in traditional societies or where they're endemic goes into a darkened room to take them. What's that about? How did therapists dream this up? Oh, well, no, I think it was... I think it was about being somewhat better than a hospital bed. Hmm. <laughs> and just to share with you, I mean, when we started doing our research at Imperial, they said, well, yeah, you can go and work, you can go and you've got to do it in the, in the clinical, clinical test facility. And you go in there and, you know, it's a, it's a concrete bunker with a bed and wires coming out. And we said, well, you know, we don't want people to have what could be one of the most profound experiences of their life 
in what looks like a prison cell, you know. And they said, well, there's nothing you can do. We've got to keep it sterile. So every day we had to come in, we had to build it to, to make it an appealing kind of place and then disassemble it every night. So that was a, it was really quite challenging to do this research in a way which was acceptable to the patients because one of the ways they tried to discredit LSD in the 60s to justify it being banned was they did a study and it, it, it was a, a truly a, atrocious study. It was a study of the year, apparently, approved, it was awarded a study of the year by the American Psychiatric Association. They took patients and they chained them to the bed and then they gave them LSD. And they said, look, it doesn't work. I mean, come on, you know, I mean, it won't if you're in that kind of horrific situation. The mind is a very powerful thing. I mean, it, near your, your research bunker at Imperial College, I, they, they used to be a a tutor at the, the Royal College of Sculptor who'd managed to get the departmental budget to invest in a sensory deprivation tank. And many years ago, 30, 40 years ago, I went in and tried it. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know if you've ever done it. It's a no, warm, it's like it's an amniotic experience because yeah. you've yeah. got this warm saline experience. There is a, it's a, it's a soundproof kind yeah. of sarcophagus really that you climb in, you settle yourself in this blood heat uh, saline solution so that you float on top of it. Gradually, to begin with, you're touching the sides, but then you fall still. It's completely dark, uh, completely silent. Very rapidly, of course, you, you, you lose any relationship between Absolutely. subjective duration and clock yeah. time. Yeah. So you yeah. lose time first, yeah. then space, then your identity starts to seem rather preposterous. Then the world starts to seem like a figment of an imagination that may once have belonged to you. But the problem with this sensory deprivation tank, and it's a bit like the patients chained to their bed, was that it had a glitch and you could hear the loo being flushed in the women's loos that were also in the basement of the Royal College. Uh, and in the middle of this complete deconstruction of the world, uh, I heard the loo flushed. And instantaneously, the world sprang up and back into being from this one noise, very much the sort of world I oh so recently left. Yes. And in fact, you'll be, yeah, I mean, I think it's a fast, it, it, it proves in a very, in a separate methodology, what we found with the brain imaging that psychedelics switch you off from the outside world in here, whereas the, the tank switches you off side out from the outside world out there because you're not, you can't, there's no contact from the outside world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we've, 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 just, we've, we've just submitted a paper where we've shown that we've looked at this question about music as part of therapy. And music can, if you play music to people, you can sometimes bring them out of the trip. It can, it's like, and like you're not, you know, you can, they can reestablish uh, their kind of normal ba you know, balance of their you know, different brain parts by, by putting in a sensory stimulus like that. So you have to be quite thoughtful about how, how you use music in therapy, because it can, it can be positive or it can be uh, undermining. Yeah, well, you know, it might work, guys, but, you know, talk to the man who knows. If you're having a bad trip, drink half a bottle of red wine and you'll come straight out of it never fails you know it's a sedative you need the front of your brain put to you sleep you need the GABA that's right it's a GABA yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this your psychedelic work I have to say David is grabbing a lot of people's attention on this Q&A you know this is obviously something that people want mm -hmm. and think is about to happen so got John Maloney here coming in quite early and saying flat out David what do you predict will be the first psychedelic compound approved medically in the UK? Uh, and, and what condition, I suppose, does he mean, will it be mm -hmm. licensed as an effective treatment for? And key, he wants, he wants you to dot and cross. How long will it take? So I, I think it'll be psilocybin, magic mushroom juice. Uh, I think it will be in three years time and it'll be for, for resistant depression. Wow, so you, you're quite confident. Is it, do you have feelers in government? Do you get a feel that the sort of lobbying that you and Amanda Fielding have been involved in, the results you've been getting from your unit uh, at Imperial are beginning to make waves, the papers have been, I mean, that seems quite a confident prediction. Well, I think if there is any benefit in my field from Brexit, it is that we can fast track innovation in medicine.
Mm. And if the government has any sense, it will try to do this because this is a, this is a British invention. You know, we did discover its utility, or you know, we've rediscovered. It was known in the sixties, but we've rediscovered in a modern way the utility of these drugs. And it would be really stupid if we didn't maximise that. So, so we're not talking bleached chicken here. We're talking a sort of homegrown. Absolutely. Addition. Yeah, yeah. Um, Free range roosters. <laughs> So then I'm going to answer a question since I've got one. Uh, how, Will, how did drugs, legal or illegal, benefit you in your mental difficulties that you've suffered in your life, if at all? Uh, from from Sunil in, in East London. I, I'm a strong advocate of marijuana. I think marijuana is a has been used across cultures the world over, uh, used therapeutically, used what we might call recreationally, used noetically in relation to our mm. spiritual questioning. I think that a lot of drug uh, researchers, I don't know whether David will answer to this or not, wrongly class it as not being uh, a psychotropic or hallucinogenic drug. It very obviously is. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And I think it's, the, it's a sort of cultural prejudice around that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's obviously possible to abuse it. It's possible to abuse spinning round and round on the office chair that has casters you know it's possible to abuse anything we know this fine well uh, but i would say of of all the drugs the safest uh, and the one that has the widest range range of applications both uh, psychically and physically is probably marijuana and i would say that all of my experience of uh neuropsychiatric compounds all of it has been completely negative, except for benzos for extreme anxiety. Uh, uh, they obviously work, they're called alcohol in pill form by people in what we must perforce call the alcohol recovery community. Uh, and I think that's a good designation, but I'm not a fan of neuropharmacology. And uh, you know, I admire David's work a lot and I think he's a brave and individual voice. And this isn't the arena in which we're going to do it. I think we should have a second head to head. But I think there are profound conceptual errors in his approach to these questions that lie outside the purview of the kind of methods and tools he uses. I see him as a man making his way forward with a kind of, you know, with a head torch when he could, in fact, just turn on the light. Yeah. <laughs> but, but but just on, on that one point there, David, you know, uh, what's what's your view on, on that question? I think you're right. I think of all the, certainly of all the non-medical drugs out there, cannabis has the widest range of utility. And it also, uh, if you consider both THC and cannabidiol and different ratios, you know, there's an enormous potential across a whole range of, of neurological disorders, psychiatric disorders, immune disorders. I think that, you know, potential, if, if the medical profession would embrace cannabis, it, it would be, and I've said this, you know, to them, it, this would be the greatest innovation in medicine for the next 20 years. Mm. Well, I was just a little disappointed that you didn't say that cannabis would be first, because I was seeing this sort of rather wacky CBD thing, and you sort of see CBD lollies everywhere. I mean, obviously, mm. they're not even at psychoactive levels, the doses. Mm. But I was wondering if that wasn't the proverbial gateway through which, because that's what happened in the States. And yeah. after it, we got proper, you know, first medical use and then legalization. Yeah. Well, I mean, cannabis is a medicine here. You can prescribe it. It's just that no one is. But can I just check you there? Because, the, you know, another question is, you know, do you have any advice on how I could ask my GP to prescribe Yes, it's it? very straightforward, and this is very important. So the Drug Science Charity, I set up website, go on the Drug Science website, and you can sign up for the cannabis program. It's called 2021, and then they will tell you what to do, how to get an, uh, an assessment, and then the, that doctor will then, if that doctor decides that you're eligible, and it's likely you will be, then you can, he'll contact the GP. So you can self-refer and then have a, a, a retrospective analysis by the you know, the consultant with your GP, and then that should allow you to access it. Brilliant, tough-minded little piece of advice there, and and excellent that drug science are providing that sort of inflection point between people taking responsibility for their own condition. So in a way, it's doing everything. It's a reversal of biosocial psychological, isn't it? 
listen, David, we could go on, uh, you know, in, and there's so much more I'd like to discuss. There's a lot of excellent questions here on the chat. And I'm and many apologies to people out there for not being able to to get to all your questions and answer them. I think the How To Academy has some shout outs for David's books and, and my own and how you can get hold of them. But uh, on behalf of David and I, I'd, I'd like to thank you all. We can feel your attention to our virtual object out there. And, and thank you for, for being such an excellent audience this evening. Thank you all. Cheers.